นาทิสันติปรังสุขัง There is no happiness other than peace. This particular saying of the Buddha has, has, an, has an interesting history. Because over time the translation turned from there is no happiness other than peace that there is no happiness higher than peace. Which totally changes the meaning. Perhaps because people thought, well, there are kinds of happiness that are not related to peace at all. The happiness of winning out over somebody else, the happiness of sensual desire. There's even a happiness that goes along with being angry. People like to be angry. And all the other defilements. There's a certain pleasure that comes with those defilements, and there's certainly no peace there. But if you look carefully, even in the defilements, there's a moment of rest, there's a moment of certainty, there's a moment of settling it for just a second. After all, the Buddha did recognize that it is possible to get into very strong states of absorption based on greed, aversion, and delusion. They're wrong concentration, but they are absorption, and there's an element of peace there, there's an element of stillness there. And whatever pleasure there is in those things, that's that's where the pleasure lies, in that little moment of peace, that moment of certainty. Of course, the problem with those kinds of peace are that they don't last very long, and they're very, very toxic, because they can lead to all sorts of disturbance afterwards. This is why the Buddha said we have to search for the highest peace, the highest happiness. They go together. And this is why the search for the highest happiness is not a selfish thing. The Buddha honors our desire for true happiness. Everywhere he says that this path is for happiness. And we should take our desire for happiness seriously. It's not something we should be ashamed of. It's not something we should say, well, I'll delay my own happiness and make other people happy first. That's not the Buddha's approach at all. He says, if you take your search for happiness seriously, find a happiness that really is reliable, it will take you to peace. It will take you to the highest peace, where you're not harming anyone at all. And in the course of developing that happiness, we have to develop really honorable qualities of mind. There's the wisdom that sees that long-term happiness is better than short-term, and that it has to depend on your actions. That's why the question that lies at the beginning of wisdom or discernment is what, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. The wisdom lies in the long-term, and it lies in the, the fact that you recognize you've got to do something for this happiness to come about. And then there's the compassion that comes as a corollary of that, which is you realize if your peace is going to last, if your happiness is going to last, it has to depend on not causing any harm to anybody else. So you have to take their desire for peace, their desire for happiness into consideration. There's that passage where the Buddha tells King Basenity, you search the world all over, you will find no one who doesn't have fierce love for themselves. You have fierce love for yourself. You look around the world, and everybody else has fierce love for themselves. So if your happiness gets in the way of their fierce love of themselves, they're not going to stand for it. There'll be no peace. So you look, have to look for happiness that doesn't depend on harming anybody. And that leads to purity. You have to look very carefully at your actions. What are you doing that could be causing harm to yourself, harm to other people? Because it's certainly not wise if you're doing that. And although there may be general instructions about what kinds of actions are harmful and which ones are not, there are a lot of little details that you can't put in books that you have to learn to observe for yourself. So you have to watch your actions by watching your intention first, 
checking that out to see if it's a honorable intention, and then watching your action as you're doing it to see what results you're getting right while you're doing it. And then after you're done, look at the long-term results. And if you find that you've caused any harm either while you're doing it, if you catch yourself while you're doing it, then you stop immediately. But if you find out only afterwards that you caused harm, then you have to make up your mind that you're not going to engage in that kind of action ever again, that kind of intention ever again. Then you go talk it over with someone. This is an important part of the Buddha's instruction in what we would call self-knowledge. In other words, you're not knowing yourself as a thing. You're knowing yourself in terms of actions. And he provides a, a context in which you can do this. And this is why he set up the monastic Sangha. So we'd have a group of people who are following the Buddhist teachings that anybody can come and consult with. Say, I did this and I got these results. What should I do? So you don't have to reinvent the Dharma wheel every time you find that you've made a mistake. This is how we develop purity, as the Buddha told Rahula. All those in the past who purified their thoughts, words, and deeds did it in this way. All those in the future who are going to do that, who are going to purify their thoughts, words, and deeds, will do it in this way. And all those at present who are purifying their thoughts, words, and deeds do it this way. So what this means, if you take your search for happiness seriously, you have to develop wisdom, compassion, and purity, you know, the virtues that are traditionally ascribed to the Buddha himself. This is part of his skill as a teacher, to show that if you take your happiness seriously, you have to develop good qualities of mind. It's not purely a hedonistic pursuit. where you're simply learning how to indulge in a sophisticated way. But you're realizing that happiness is something that's important. And if it really is important, then you have to develop important qualities of mind. And as we do this, we find that our actions become less and less harmful. There's less and less cause for conflict. On the one hand, that makes it easier for us to practice, and on the other hand, it makes the world a better place to be in in general. In particular, in terms of our thoughts, because, of course, our actions and our words come out of our thoughts. And this is where the Buddha finds the source of conflict to begin with. There's a sutta where Saka, the king of the devas, comes down to see the Buddha. He's got some questions for the Buddha. It's an interesting sutta. It starts out with Saka trying to get the Buddha in the right mood to talk with the deva king. So he sends down one of his musicians. That's one of the nicer pieces of humor in the Pali Canon. The musician comes down and he sings a song about the Buddha and the Dharma, the Sangha, and lust. It's a song directed to his Lady Love, talking about how he loves her as much as the Arahants love the Dharma, and goes through catalogs her body parts, the parts that he loves, as much as the Arahants love the Dharma. And you can imagine the Buddha smiling to himself. He said, this is totally deluded little Deva here. But at the end of the song, he compliments the Deva on having written a song where the melody goes well with the words, and the words go well with the melody. After all, he was a prince, he was a connoisseur of music back when he was a layperson. And finally, Saka comes and asks the Buddha questions about conflict. Because after all, I don't know if you know the story, but in Indian mythology, it's very similar to Greek mythology, and there's a story of how the, the devas fought the asuras for control of heaven, finally beat the asuras, in the same way that the Greek gods had to fight the titans. And so having become Deva King and having to have had to go through this war even when he was a Deva, Saka was very concerned about conflict. What are the roots of conflict? And so the Buddha traces them back through acquisition, through desire, all the way back to Papancha, 
or objectification. The type of thinking where we turn ourselves into an object and then turn everybody else into an object. And as an object, we need a place to stay in the world. And so we have to stake out our territory in the world, whether it's physical territory, material territory, even our views. Because after all, once you objectify other people, they're in the course of the project of objectifying themselves. They may not like the role that you assign to them. There's conflict right there. And psychologists talk a lot about objectification, how we turn other people into objects. And the Buddha's insight was that we start out by turning ourselves into objects. This is why the path to peace, upasamaya, as we chanted just now, the path leading to calm, the path leading to peace, starts with right view, which instead of looking at your experience in terms of yourself and other people or the world, i.e. objects in the world, looks at things simply as stress, its cause, its cessation, and the path leading to its cessation. Terms that don't refer to people at all. But each of them has a skill. That's what that section there, when we went through all the knowledge of all the noble truths and the knowledge the Buddha had with regard to them. There's the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge of the duty appropriate to it, and then the knowledge that the duty was done. So in the case of stress, you have to know it, you have to comprehend it, which means knowing it so thoroughly, seeing it so thoroughly that you finally get dispassionate toward it. In the case of the origination of stress, that means abandoning it, in other words, not continuing to do it anymore. The cessa cessation of stress is to be witnessed or verified, and the path is to be developed. The wheel and the Dharma wheel there is that list of taking each of the four truths and setting against the variables of these three kinds of knowledge. So as he said, you've got twelve aspects of this knowledge. That's the Dharma wheel. Back in India, when they had these sets of variables lined up against one another, they would call them wheels. So this is the Dharma wheel. And it's interesting that this is the only place in the whole canon where the Buddha mentions this. It's his most important teaching. You'd think it'd be all over the canon. But it's just in the context of this one talk. There are a few reflections in a few other places, but this is the only place where he sets it out clearly. But it's a teaching we have to keep in mind all the time. This is why he has us divide our experience into the Four Noble Truths, so we know what to do with whatever comes up. Because if we still think in terms of selves and the world, our duty is to stake out our self-territory and then to defend it. But here he has us look at things in other, in other terms, with other duties. For instance, with stress. If you think of yourself as a self, you don't like having the stress in yourself and you try to get rid of it. But getting rid of it is not the duty under the Four Truths. The duty is to comprehend it, to know it. And that requires that you develop the path, so you have the mind in good, strong concentration. Mindful and alert, imbued with right effort, so you can develop these skills. Because each of the tasks is actually a skill. This is why the path is a gradual path, because it takes a while to develop the skills. After all, Nirvana is very, very subtle. And even though it's immediately present, the possibility of reaching it <coughs> is theoretically available at any moment in time. Our powers of perception aren't up to it. Our skills are not skillful enough, not subtle enough. So we have to raise the subtlety of our mind as we develop these skills until finally we reach the level where we can have that sudden awakening into the ultimate peace. The image the Buddha gives is of the continental shelf off of India. It's a gradual, gradual slope out, and all of a sudden a sudden drop.
And the reason the path has to be that way is because nirvana is present but subtle. So we have to gradually develop the subtlety of our mind so that we can then see what's oh, right here. As the Buddha said, it's something you touch with your body, see with your body. The synesthesia there is interesting. There's no more division among the six senses. It's just it's an awareness that's outside of the six senses. And that, he says, is the ultimate peace. Causes no harm to anyone. It's an area, he says, or a sphere or a dimension of no objectification at all. So the question is, what happens to you when you're in that doesn't occur anymore because the you that you created as an object or the world that you created as a place for objects, those concepts apply only as far as the six senses. Those are things that we create out of the six senses, and when you move beyond the six senses, those concepts have no more meaning. But we still live in the six senses, and we're still objectifying. So sometimes the Buddha would teach in, in objective terms, the kinds of questions you ordinarily would not like to answer, like, what was I in the past? What am I going in the future? Ordinarily you'd put those questions aside, but occasionally there's there are spots in the canon where he talks to people about what they were in the past. But he speaks in ways that are designed to give rise to that dispassion that comes with comprehension. Now you see, this really is a lot of suffering. Going through this process of samsaraing is pretty miserable. You've probably heard the comparison of all the water in the oceans as being less than the tears you've shed. Well, there's one sutta that's even more dramatic. He says all the blood that you've lost by having your head cut off is greater than the water in the oceans. Excuse me, the water in the oceans is less than the tears you've shed, and it's less than the blood that you've lost. And then he goes through all the different ways you might have lost blood by having your head cut off, either when you were cow. The number of times you've been a cow and have your head cut off, the amount of blood you've lost from that is still greater than all the water in the oceans. The number of times you've been a sheep and have your sheep's head cut off is greater than all the the blood you've lost then is greater than all the water in the oceans, and so on, through different beings, different kinds of animals. And then he goes into the times that you were a thief and had your head cut off, the times you were an adulterer or adulteress and had your head cut off. It's an awful lot of blood, and it's an awful lot of miserable existences. So he answers the question of what were you in a way that really does lead to dispassion, the kind of comprehension of suffering. This is enough. And the sutta says that all the monks who listened to that particular Dharma talk all became arhats right away, because they saw that in Objectifying yourself, this is what kind of these are the kinds of things you come up with. You become a thief, you become high, a high ray robber, you become an adulterer, adulteress, you become cows, sheep, goats, whatnot. Then there's this constant conflict. So his insight is, if you learn how to stop objectifying yourself, then you don't turn other people into objects, and you can live with them in a lot greater peace. And once you find the peace of Nibbana, then you have found a happiness that doesn't require that anybody suffer at all. So this is why we find the ultimate happiness, because it's also the ultimate peace. It's a gift not only to ourselves, but to everybody else, which is why this is such a good path to be on. Even though there's some stress and there's some difficulties in following this path, we haven't totally gotten to the place where we're not placing a burden on other people. We try to be as unburdensome as possible. But the simple fact that we're here with a body that needs to be fed, clothed, sheltered, given medicine, that does place a weight on the world. 
So there's no real reason why we should want to come back. Even if we have altruistic reasons, it still involves a certain weight, a certain burden on other people just to maintain this body. So happiness that doesn't require that kind of weight or that kind of burden is a very precious thing. And the peace that comes with that is precious as well. <laughs>